Okay, now uh, we're going to continue the series that we started. We're talking about lots of senses and things like that. Um, here's the deal. And I know that I'm not the only one that does this. I know that. And you can raise your hand so I don't feel so uh, ashamed. But have you ever, by the way, when you put something in Tupperware, it does not stay fresh for 27 years. I mean, it has, it expires. So when, have you ever opened up a Tupperware and smelled it and it was awful? First thing you do is what? Smell this, right? That's what I do to Melanie every time. I'm like, oh, smell this. This is awful. Like as if I want you to partake in this awful stench with me, but there's there's something about it. Like I want to share this moment with you. And there's something about our sense of smell that's actually triggers memories and emotion. Fall is coming up. We just got one of those pumpkin candles and it smells like fall, right? Uh, You know, um, uh, Christmas is going to be coming not before, you know, not before long. I love real Christmas trees. I don't like, I know fake trees look a lot better and they don't, you know, the needles don't fall off. But I love the smell of real Christmas trees. And when I smell them, it reminds me of being a kid and listening to Johnny Mathis or Nat King Cole and decorating the tree. And it brings back all of those memories. You know, so there's a lot of of sense to this. And we've been talking about a sense and what that does. And we're talking about it in terms of scripture and the fact that uh, God gave us these senses for a reason. And it's primarily one of the things is, is that he has them too. He has them as well. You see, we're not just a a collection of atoms just randomly put together. Our creator created us in his image, so we have his image, meaning we have his senses as well. And it's sprinkled all over scripture. And and I don't have time to go into all these messages, but to show you that we are created in his image and that sense has a strong sense for, for God, the sense of smell, God tells his people in Exodus 29, 18 to barbecue fat animals and the aroma will be pleasing to him. In Leviticus 6, 5, priests are told to burn incense as you go into, uh, on behalf of God, as you go into the temple. In Isaiah 60, uh, 65, 5, God tells their, the people that their attitudes are a rotten stench to his nostrils. Hey, and this is true, and you can look it up. In Ezekiel 4, 12, and 13, Ezekiel literally lights poop on fire to illustrate God is displeased with you. Okay, it's not, you can't make this stuff up. In the Song of Songs, that's in 713, the king knows his wife's in the mood by what lotion she's wearing and how she smells. You want to, you know, uh, it's true. Guys, don't try that. It might not work for you. Now, in Ecclesiastes 10.1, foolish people, it says, stink up the place. And in Philippians uh, 4.18, it says, the generosity of the early Christians is actually, uh, quote, a sweet-smelling sacrifice. I'm going somewhere with this. Yes, it means our physical sense of smell. That's true. And God, we're created in God's image, but it also means other things. And like everything else, hearing and sight, it means a lot of other things. As we talked about, the ancient rabbis would say that in translation, they would say the Bible is a 70-sided jewel. Scripture means a lot of different things. So the question is, why does God feel the need to give us his smell preferences? And what do these things even mean? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't mean just your physical sense. Yes, that's functioning. It's correct. God does mean it literally, and it's your functioning thing of sm- sense of smell. It also is characterizing. It's the distinct aroma something gives off. Something's off here. It's perfuming. It's the adding of a fragrance through lotion, cologne, or body wash. It's flavoring, the ability to assist the tongue in discerning taste. It's trailing, the faint smell of uh, or evidence left behind. It's also anticipating the expectation that certain clues are pointing to a specific outcome. It means a lot more than just what's on the surface. So why in the world would God attach so many emotions to this one sense? Why would he do it? It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Why would you attach all of these different emotions to your sense of smell? And I think it's because of the brain's tendency to organize our memories according to scent. Okay? Guys, I'm telling you, I mean, who doesn't know what grandma's kitchen smells like? When you smell grandma's kitchen, if, that, if you get that scent later in life, it'll remind you of being a kid going into grandma's kitchen. Uh, Disneyland, okay, as you, many of you know, I love going to Disneyland uh, be in, primarily because my family didn't go on many vacations. Uh, we didn't do many things together. My parents were always working. So one of the few things we did was we'd go to Disneyland once a year, and we would circle that day, and we couldn't wait to go. And that's why today I love taking my kids. 
But when you go down Main Street, it has a distinct smell. Yes, I know it smells like money because they charge us for everything. But it also, in addition to that, it has a distinct smell. And if you go to Disneyland a lot, you know what I'm saying. You could just close your eyes and smell the popcorn and all the other things happening. And you know you're at Disneyland. Uh, guys, if I, hear, if I smell this, and I know Vic's going to agree with me on this, if I smell Chanel perfume, I'm going to instantly think of my mom. It brings you back to those places. Why? Why would scent take us back emotionally like that? Guys, according to the Harvard Brain Science Initiative, now these are smart guys, Harvard Brain Science Initiative, odors are processed by the same system that regulates emotions and memories. But here's the deal, guys. I don't need Harvard scientists to tell me that. God's already told me that. Our creator has already told me that. I don't need these studies to tell me this. Now, this is why certain smells don't just make us think of specific things, but they also make us feel in a specific way. There's certain scents that make you do that. In, scent, in short, scents mark moments. Again, we see many examples all over scripture. And I think it's because God says, I don't want you to forget what I'm saying to you. Because if, if, you if I tell you, you're going to forget it. But if I attach a scent to it, It'll remind you of what I'm trying to show you. Studies show, guys, that you're probably going to forget 75% of what I'm telling you right now by tonight when you're watching football. Okay? By the time the Raiders, or by the time the Rams destroy the Cardinals today, you're going to forget most of what I said. And by Tuesday, you'll forget all of what I said. But if you attach it to a scent, you will remember. I know it sounds weird, so before you leave, take a big whiff of me. I'm kidding. Don't do that. But if you attach a scent to it, you'll actually remember it. That's how your brain's going to remember it. Uh, one of the biggest examples of this is straight from the life of Jesus. In Matthew 26, 6, it says this. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leopard, a woman uh, came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining on the table. Now, a lot of you might have read that passage and go, what does that mean? Who, what is, who cares? Why is this important? The, when the disciples see this, they become very, very angry really quickly. Like, why is he doing this? In Matthew 26, 8 says, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. So at this point, guys, the disciples are like, we've been listening to Jesus. He's been super good. Everything he says has been right on the money, but now we've caught him and he's wrong. He has now went Hollywood on us because he wants this super expensive perfume on him and he could have sold that and given it to the poor. He has been talking to us about the poor and the widows and the orphans. And now, now that he's starting to become a celebrity, he wants all this you know, expensive perfume on him. What are you doing, Jesus? And they're correcting Jesus. They're saying, what's your problem? Are you going Hollywood on us? What's going on? What's this, what is this waste for? And Jesus knows this. And in Matthew 26, 10, it says, aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. At this point, they are totally confused to what he's saying. What are you talking about? You're alive. What, what, is this, they, what does this even mean? You're preparing you for burial? Uh, what, what, this doesn't make any sense. Now, let me give you some context here. At that time, when you would die, what they would do is they would, uh, because the, the, the uh, loved ones and the family wanted to keep you around as long as possible. So before your body would really start to smell and decay, they would wash your body with cold water. And then they would put lotions and perfumes and uh, it's called, actually, it's called a nard. And what they would do, what that was, was basically lotions and perfumes and colognes and things like that. And myrrh, maybe any of you guys would know myrrh was from when Jesus was born, that significance had with his, uh, with his crucifixion, where they put more uh, myrrh on him or on the dead bodies. Then they would wrap the body uh, in a white sheet and then wrap it from head to toe. And that was in the process of trying to keep this body smelling as good as long as possible. And so that way loved ones can go visit the body for as long as possible and pay their respects. Okay, so that was kind of what his train of thought was. Now think about this for a second. When she puts this perfume on his head, think about that. This is, in the, and to give you context, this is happening the week of his, of his crucifixion. So the entire week that he's walking around, his scent was the scent of sacrifice. 
because that's what it would have smelled like to, uh, to preserve a dead body. Okay? So when the, when, the, when the disciples smell that later, they would immediately associate that with crucifixion and then later resurrection. Matthew 26, 13, Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is a big deal. This all goes back to the scent of smell. What does he smell like? He smells like sacrifice. Look what Paul says about this in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 2.15. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death, and to the other, the aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Now, what does that mean? That means that the aroma that you're giving off, you're either giving off something that stinks to people, or you're giving off something that smells good. Are you talking about perfume or cologne or deodorant? No. What I am talking about, doing something that honors God. And that's a sacrifice to somebody else. What could that smell like? That could smell like a meal you just made for somebody who just lost their job. And you took it over to their house. And when they smell that meal, they're going to remember the kindness of what somebody did for them. That could smell like uh, soap that you wash somebody's car with because they were down and out and they didn't have enough money to even get a car wash. So you said, hey, don't worry, I'm going to do it for you. And when they smell that certain soap, they're going to think of sacrifice. It could smell like diapers, okay? Because it's, a, well, <laughs> unused diapers. Uh, used diapers have a, a much different scent. But um, unused diapers, it could smell like that, you know? Like that was when that church showed us a sacrifice. They sacrificed for us. It all smells like sacrifice. So again, the week of Jesus' life, his scent, his smell was sacrifice. In Romans 21, one says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship, okay? This is your true and proper worship, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that mean when you say that? Well, sacrifice actually smelled good. Just to give you a, a context of this, in this time or ancient Jewish uh, uh, tradition, what they would do is when you would go to the temple, it actually smelled good. And here's why. There was no indoor plumbing back then. People didn't wear a lot of deodorant. Okay, there was, uh, you know, only very, very wealthy people had these lotions and things like that because perfumes were extremely expensive. So everything kind of smelled pretty bad, except when you would go to the temple when they would sacrifice. Why? Because you're sacrificing an animal and barbecue smells good. So when you're going through life and life has like this bad smell, I'm going to go to the temple where it smells actually good. And that was that sacrifice was actually a sweet smell to the people. Okay, this author demonstrates that you're, when you're a Christ follower uh, by living in a way that he makes the discouraging situations around you uh, and that you are facing smell delicious. I know that there are a lot of things going on in um, our lives right now. And the sense of smell doesn't seem like such a big deal. It's like, well, that's just a scent. Maybe it is kind of, doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but honestly, guys, um, it is. Um, when I, when, when, um, you know, I was going through some, uh, really difficult times in my life personally, uh, I remember a friend of mine would take me to this one particular Japanese food place. And honestly, right now, every time I smell teriyaki, I feel hope. I know it seemed like a nothing thing to him and he's probably forgotten about it, but I remember that he took the time to really invest in me. What could the, that look like for you? What could it look like for you? Well, this is a really simple example. Check this out. The thing that I would suggest, as I did to a girl yesterday, do your best no matter what you are doing. And thank God that you can do it. Most of us, a lot of us, I should say here, are not too far behind me. <laughs> She's making friends. Making friends. How do you make? How did I make it this far? I would say right now, this kind of thing in which people love each other, 
talk to each other, help each other, and just anything. Don't hold a grudge of any kind. Love people, even if they don't love you. I love that. That was actually not the video I was talking about, but I do love that. I had another one that I was going to show you, uh, and it was about, basically, I'll explain it to you. It was about this young man, and there was a lady, and she was an elderly woman, and he goes up to her at the, uh, at the grocery uh, store, and he says, I'm sorry, ma'am, I think you dropped something. And she said, I did. And when she went to go look at like she dropped it, he gave, he slipped his card to the cashier, and she paid for the groceries. And so... She looked up and he said, this guy already paid your groceries. And she looked at him and, and she couldn't believe it. And he said, I hope that helped out a little. She goes, you have no idea how much it helped out. I just lost everything financially. And I, and I was basically just hopeless and helpless. And she was able to give him a big hug. And it was really, really sweet. Guys, and I have no idea what cologne that guy was wearing or shampoo he was wearing. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you, whatever he was wearing, that lady, next time she smelled it, she would associate it with hope and, and with love. Guys, what is your scent giving off to people? What are you going to do? Because you'd be wise to attach memorable scents to the moments you can't afford to forget. You know, guys, I know it sounds crazy, but chlorine now and, and that kind of smell, it reminds me of baptisms. We're doing baptisms again, and... Uh, uh, we, we're not going to use chlorine. Um, the last time we washed it uh, with wipes and the water was pretty cloudy and I'm glad nobody got dysentery. But when we baptize again, that's going to trigger people to a certain thing. The biggest moments in our life are the moments that God showed up when we didn't think he was going to show up. And I know, guys, that there are moments in your life right now where you're like, I don't know if God's going to show up for this one. I need this job. I need this health thing. I need these finances fixed. I, I, I need this person to accept me and love me. I need my kids to be this or that. And you're in that moment and you're like, I, I just don't see God doing this. God is at work right now. And when he does bless you and whatever it is you're smelling at that moment, attach it to that memory because we forget what he does all the time. When we're depressed and down and out, it's because we're not looking at what God's doing. We're looking at what we want and what we're not getting. Instead of what, God, what is God doing in our life right now? Guys, listen to me. Our grand opening is coming up in a couple weeks. I've given everything I can give to this church. Melanie and I have. I'm going to give it everything I got. I'm going to go for it. There's no way I could do this by myself. I need every one of us, if you're watching online, every one of us to take part in what God is going to do. He is going to do something, guys. I'm saying it because I believe it. If I didn't believe in God, if I thought he was just some fairy tale, then I wouldn't be doing this. I would pick something that was a lot less stressful and paid a lot more, if I'm being honest with you. I did this because I believe God said, I want you to go plant a church. So go do it. And I'm doing it. But I, I know that he has got something planned for us. Guys, I thought about this this week. Wouldn't it be cool? Because we're having tacos. Wouldn't it be cool? If, and this is not out of the ordinary. The next time someone goes and smells tacos, they go, that was the place that I got baptized. That was the place that when we were healed, they prayed over my family. That was the place where our marriage got restored. That was the place where I found the love of my life. That was the place where I gave my life to Christ. That was the place where my kids gave their life to Christ. If they just smell tacos, it has that sense of, I remember where I was when I smelled that scent. And why not us? And, and, and really, why, why not now? You know, I've, I've had um, people ask me before, um, and if I'm being totally candid with you, just we're all family here. Even when I started working here, I've had uh, friends of mine uh, who became good friends um, say, I saw your messages online. And this is when we were at the yacht club. And I don't know if you're ever going to get a, 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 a building or not, but 
you know what, you're really good at what you do. If you ever want to come over here, we'll pay you more. We'll give you a lot more benefits and the whole deal. And there were times where it was tough. And as pa- pastors know this, you guys, pastors know this, this very real. When you're out there and you're greeting people and there are some Sundays where it does not a lot of people and you're just like, ah, and you're driving home going, what am I doing with my life? I'm giving everything I got and somebody didn't come to church because they stubbed their toe that morning or because they would rather watch a program on TV or whatever, whatever. What am I doing? I felt like I'm sacrificing everything. Should, should I be doing this? And I'm constantly reminded, just standing on this stage, that God is doing something supernatural. This was not supposed to happen. It, it was clearly not. Guys, honestly, when I smell coffee and donuts, I think of hope. You don't know this, but we don't buy, the church doesn't buy coffee and donuts. We don't have the budget right now. We spend all of our money just moving in here. Our members uh, go out, and, they, and uh, w- when they come in, they, Patty or Caroline, I know they don't want me naming them off, but they go in, and they buy that stuff, and they bring it in. And so now when I smell that, I actually smell love. Oh, that's what we're doing. That's what sacrifice looks like. I had somebody t- tell me a couple of weeks ago, and I'm just being very candid with you, and I'm not very politically correct, so... Uh, I'm just going to say whatever I feel like. (laughs) Um, They came to me the other week and they said, you know, what's a crying shame? And I said, what's a crying shame? And they said, the government gives so much money to uh, all these nonprofits and all of a sudden you could apply for a government grant and they could take care of all of your financial situations. And I said, I would never do that in a million years. And they said, why are you too proud? And I said, no, but remember this guys. And I want to make this very clear. Whatever, whatever the government funds, the government owns. Right. And we're not going to be owned by the government. Look what they did to our schools, for goodness sakes. Right. And that has nothing against teachers. I love teachers. My wife is a teacher. But what they're doing in our schools is criminal. And they've got the, they're funding it. Nobody owns the church. God owns the church. And it's our responsibility to fund the church. So no, I don't ask out there and, hey, what kind of programs? No, if this is your church and if you're watching online and if this is your church, then show up, invite, and give and serve because we're responsible for this church, not the government or anybody else. And I want to make that super duper clear. Why do we have the funds to, to have this church here and have these events? Because of your sacrifice your sacrifice, you showing up. And and guys, it's a complete myth that only people give because they have extra money. I see the names of everybody that's giving. And I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of people that don't have any extra money whatsoever. And when I see their sacrifice, you bet I'm going to give this everything I got. You bet I will. So guys, I am, I am excited. I'm excited to see what this church is going to do. His church, God's church. And in a couple of weeks, we are going to celebrate the grand opening of a fulfillment of a miracle that we all prayed, sacrificed, and gave for and served for. And we're going to see what the Holy Spirit does in this place. Do not miss it. If you're watching online, do not miss it. Don't miss what God wants to do through you. Okay? It's his church, but we're responsible for it. And when he's saying, listen, I'm ready to go whenever you are. I've got all of this planned for my church. Are you ready? Let's go then. That's what he's saying. So my question to you is very simple. Are you guys ready? I'm going to ask that again. Are you guys ready? All right, then let's do this. Okay, let's pray. Father, I, uh, I thank you so much, God, that you, again, use flawed people to do your work and to do your will. God, I I know that you have got big plans for this church. And I know that it's our responsibility to show up, to serve, to give, to invite, to pray. Father God, out of all the things that I could do with my life, my time, my gifts, my money, my, my efforts, I couldn't think of anything better than building your church. 
this brand new church who hasn't even had its very first birthday yet. This brand new church who has not even technically launched yet. And you're already doing some seriously cool and amazing things, God. I pray that we stack hands. And for those of us who are committed and willing to start your church, that you bless us, God. You bless us with our words and with our actions. And that you make what you want to see happen. And that we follow you the entire way. I can't wait to see the culmination of years of working and serving and sacrificing and giving and praying and inviting. And to see in a couple of weeks, these, this tub up here being filled with water and baptisms. Parents that are saying, we want our children to be dedicated to you, God. Kids that are brand new to this church. Out there petting lizards and all kinds of other things tacos out there, God. People getting prayed for and loved on and seeing this brand new church. There's something different about that place. There's something different about those people. Help all of this sacrifice to be revealed to those people that we are here and we are serving and we are giving because we love them and we want them to see who you are. So we can't wait to see what you've got for us, God. And we are ready for this challenge. It's in your name. Amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a church center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, or whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances, and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you, and thank you for watching our online service today.